Pierre Moran, or no, which one was it? Marquette, that's it. And we took a day hiking and praying and fellowshipping, and it was great. So come on, Brother Blue and Sister Blue's going to sing, or they're debating. We sure love you guys. And like I said, so good to have Jessica and Tim, and, and uh, they have another son in the area, Brandon. So they're home, they're busy evangelizing, and just had a, a, a Sunday off. Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to be in church tonight, isn't it? Amen. Yes. And to feel the good presence of the Lord here and, and uh, enjoyed all of the singing and so happy to be here. It's an honor for us and uh, feels like a family reunion to me to, uh, to be with our old friends, uh, Brother and Sister Goldeisen. We want to congratulate you, Pastor Appreciation Day. And uh, yes, go ahead. Amen. I'm sure that there was many things said today. Uh, we've been on the phone with Sister Kelly. Brother Eric and Sister Kelly invited us to be here uh, today, tonight, and so we appreciate that. And uh, Sister Kelly told us some of the things that they would be doing today, so I'm sure you had a wonderful, wonderful day. So congratulations, and coming up on four years in November. That's, uh, that's amazing, too. Well, we're really happy to be here. I look back over my notes, and the last time that we were here was in January of 2012. So how did that time slip by so fast, coming up on three years? But, uh, but anyways, we're glad to be here tonight. We've been looking forward to the service, and uh, said family reunion, uh, the Goldeisen family. They're, you know, we're not related technically, but we're all family in the Lord, aren't we? And, uh, and then we are really happy to have our daughter, Jessica, son-in-law, Tim, and two grandsons with us tonight. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm really happy to be in church with my grandsons tonight. Aren't, aren't, how many of you have grandchildren? Aren't they special? Aren't they wonderful? You know what? Grandkids are your reward for not killing your own kids. And... Jessica, there was times I was tempted, but uh, but she lived, and uh, we we lived, and now we've got we've got uh, these two and and another grandson and a granddaughter that was born to us back in July, and so we're we're really happy to you know, have them here in service with us tonight. We don't get to be in church together that often, and, uh, and so it's a real treat for us. Both of my grandsons, these two boys down here recently, made their own personal decision to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I'm, I'm thankful and happy about that. We do a lot of children's ministry, my wife and I, uh, through the summer months, children and youth ministry. We believe that we need to try to reach, reach them while they're young. And so I, I, I know that teenagers have a lot of trouble. We're trying to help teenagers get through the difficult phases of their life. But, uh, but we also say this, that if, if, if we wait till they become teenagers to try to reach them, we may have waited too late. And, and children are capable of understanding the gospel and receiving Jesus. And if we can get the word of God in their heart while they're young, it does make a difference in their future. And so, uh, well, just a little sermon before the sermon tonight. We're happy to be here, and we appreciate the opportunity. God bless you. We want the Lord to have his way. LaDonna's going to try to sing. She's been in the ladies' conference all week down in Branson, Missouri. She's a co-host there, and uh, been a busy week. And she sort of got run down and on the verge of getting a cold. So she's gone back and forth on whether she's going to try to sing or not. But uh, come, and, come and say hello. Well, it's good to be here in service with you all. Good to see our friends, the Knots. We haven't seen you all for a while. It's good to see you all again. Our brother back here, I forgot your last name. But anyway, yes. Glad, glad, yeah, Brother Evans, we're glad to be in service with you all. And uh, we want to honor Brother and Sister Goldeisen today for Pastor Appreciation. And Sister Goldeisen and I were standing over there and said, everybody keeps talking about getting old. Who's getting old? Uh, I don't claim getting old yet. I 
I've just got a lot of miles on me. But anyway, it's good to be here tonight. And if you all will um, excuse me, I may end up having a cough in the middle of the song. But Sister Kelly requested that I sing, and so I'm doing this for you too, Sister Kelly. All right. So if you know the song, just help me sing. The Lord has brought me through all my sorrows. When I failed him, he didn't cast me away. He stood right by me through all my troubles. When I was gone, he didn't let me go astray. But he took my sin and he saved my soul. He cleaned me up and he made me whole. My Jesus died on Calvary. So the whole world. How many of you are happy to be saved tonight? Praise God. Are you really happy to be saved? Amen. Through the service, we seem to be uh, striking a, a, um, a vein here of uh, emphasis on salvation. Brother Guy started the service with, I was once a sinner saved by grace. And then we sang Amazing Grace. 
and LaDonna here singing about, it was a great thing when the Lord saved me. I've been testifying a lot more this year than, than I had in a while because uh, this year, back around Easter time, marked my 40th anniversary or my 40th spiritual birthday. And, uh, and I got saved 40 years ago. I didn't know anything about God, didn't know anything about the Lord, had never really been to church maybe once in my life. I was 19 years old when I got saved. Had hair down the middle of my back. I, 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 say it, I say it this way. My brief description is I was a long-haired hitchhiking hippie back in those days. And uh, I was in Jamaica, West Indies, buying drugs to bring back to the States to sell. When the Lord got my attention in a little Jamaican church and, uh, and let me know how much I needed him. And so I got saved. And, uh, and that was 40 years ago. Some of you weren't even born then, and uh, that seems like a long time ago, but let me tell you this, the real, the real testimony there, as grateful as I am for the, for the born-again experience and, and the transformation is that here it is 40 years later, 40 years later, and people would have looked at that long-haired hippie hitchhiking on the side of the road and thought there's no chance he'll ever, you know, amount to anything. Or, or certainly after I got saved, how long, how long is he going to be able to stay in? Forty years by the grace of God. I never went back, never looked back, never want to go back. I'm glad to be saved tonight. How many of you are glad to be saved? Give the Lord a hand clap. Give him a praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Amen. I... Uh, I hesitate to um, tell that, that even that brief description of my former life and my grandson sitting here. I don't want them to try to imagine me with hair down the middle of my back. It would be nice if they could imagine me with a little bit more hair than I've got. But, <laughs> Amen. But glad to be saved tonight. Turn with me, if you will, to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. And... Um, to be honest with you, I went back and forth about this service. I know that it's a uh, pastor appreciation day, and Sister Kelly told me, um, you know, just whichever way I, I felt led. She said, we're just going to have church Sunday night, and uh, we'll do all the pastor appreciation stuff on Sunday morning. Just want to give Brother Goldeisen a break, and, uh, and, um, and yet um, I still went back and forth and then got up this morning about 4 o'clock. And it was like the Lord just put this in my heart. And I think that it's, uh, this will give me an opportunity to go b both ways, both ways with the message. I want to say some things about, about the ministry and about uh, the pastor. But uh, I really believe that, um, that, this, uh, that this message will apply to anybody here tonight from the front to the back, from side to side. No matter what, uh, what you're going through, the Lord knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly what you're going through, and he wants to help you tonight. He wants to help us tonight. So I'm going to read from the book of Jeremiah, if you want to turn there, to chapter 38, Jeremiah 38. And I see a couple of you standing already, so if that's your custom, let's stand together for the reading of the scripture. And... Um, I won't read the whole chapter, but uh, we'll read a few verses here, starting in verse number 6. And I'll just tell you that uh, at first this is going to kind of sound, you know, gloomy, um, but, uh, but uh, it's the end of the story that I really want, want to get to, okay? So, uh, so follow along with me tonight. Jeremiah chapter uh, 38 and verse number 6. Then took they Jeremiah... And cast him into the dungeon of Malachiah, the son of Hamalek, that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Now that's, that's really a tragic picture. And when we read about the mire, we're, we're just simply talking about mud there. So let, let's read on. Now when ebed melech the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, 
heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, Ebed-Melech went forth out of the king's house. By the way, how'd you like to be up here tonight with microphone in hand reading all of these names? Hmm? All right. So, uh, so Ebed-Melech, that's a, that's a mouthful right there. He went, he went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon. And he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, whew, boy, Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. So Ebed-Melech took the men with him, and went into the house of the king under the treasury, and took thence old cast clouts and old rotten rags, and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. And Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast clouts and rotten rags under thine armholes under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in, in the court of the prison. So not really in prison and certainly not in the dungeon. That, that's the happy ending of the story. Amen. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, preach to you tonight, if the Lord will help me, on daybreak in the dungeon. Let's pray that the Lord will help us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for helping us in this service tonight. We thank you, Lord, for honoring this pastor with this special day in, uh, in the fellowship of his people. And now, Lord, on this Sunday night, we pray that you would speak to all of us through your word that you would call us all into your presence, change us for your glory. Lord, we pray that if there be anyone here tonight that may feel like they are in a deep, dark dungeon, Lord, that you would, you would help them and encourage them, all of us together, Lord. In Jesus' name, we'll give you the praise for anything that's accomplished here tonight. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Praise God. And you may be seated tonight. Praise the Lord. Daybreak in the dungeon. Let me tell you um, that while I in, in, in intend, as I said a few minutes ago, to, to say some things about, about preachers and, and pastors and in the, uh, in the personage of Jeremiah in this story, this is not intended to sound like a pity party uh, for preachers and their problems, but, uh, but I do want to make you uh, aware of the fact that even preachers get in a pit. Amen. And... Uh, and we all need help. We all get in pits. We all get in. We all get in a in a dungeon. Amen. And Jeremiah is a, an example of this of this uh, horrible situation that he's found himself in. We might be tempted to think that Jeremiah doesn't deserve this, and certainly he doesn't, as far as as uh, human eyes are concerned, and in God's eyes, he doesn't deserve it. Remember, Jeremiah was a tremendous prophet. He was a tremendous prophet. He was a preacher of God's word. He, he, he writes one of the largest pro prophetical books in the entire Old Testament. His ministry covers a, a, a wide uh, spectrum. And, and not only his prophetical book of Jeremiah, but we also know that he's written some of the Psalms. We know that he wrote the book of Lamentations. This is a tremendous man of God. He has insight, revelation from God. The Lord has been speaking to him about things to come and, and, uh, uh, and, and even about people's personal problems. And, and, and he is preaching with great fervency. There's a fire, he even said, shut up in his bones. And uh, uh, Jeremiah is a tremendous prophet. We also remember him as a tearful prophet. He is what we call in our, um, in, our, uh, in our theological books as the weeping prophet. 
Jeremiah is the man that goes forth with tears in his eyes and he cries out against the sins of his generation, but he does so through the, uh, the streams of tears running down his face as he is burdened about the condition of his people. He's a tender-hearted man. So he's a tremendous prophet, but he's also a tearful prophet. But probably, probably at the core of it all is the fact that he is a truthful prophet. He proclaims the word of God without fear or favor of man. And don't let those tears in his face make you think of him as a softy in any sense of the word. This is a man that's proclaiming the truth of God when the truth is not popular. In fact, it is the truth that's going to get him in this problem. It is the truth that's going to get him in this prison. Can I tell you tonight that, uh, that the, the devil still delights in putting preachers in prisons? He wants to try to stop the forward progress of the church. The devil, our enemy, is still doing everything in his ability, everything in his power to try to hinder the preaching of the truth. And, 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 and I, I really believe that we are on the brink of a major change here in the United States of America. Amen. We're already seeing that uh, there's this political correctness that, uh, that, that uh, you know, that wants to side in with even the most extreme and violent um, uh, radicalism of, of Islam and at the same time blame all of the ills of our country on Christianity. There's a, there's a temperature change taking place in our nation. This is a dangerous crossroads that we're at. This, this, just in the last couple of weeks, I know that you've heard the reports about, uh, about uh, that group of preachers down in Houston, Texas, that were given a, they, they were given an ultimatum by the, uh, by the uh, mayor of Houston um, uh, who is gay, by the way, and 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 uh, rec and was summon summonsing them to uh, provide uh, copies of all of their sermon notes, so that they could that they could proofread them and see what they're saying publicly that might be offensive to people. This is a dangerous time that we're living in, right. and 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 so we see that that there's a there's a great uh, change. And, um, and, and so we, we think that there is at least a possibility that, that uh, preachers in the future preaching from these pulpits that proclaim the truth of God's word may suffer the consequences, maybe even jail time or, or at least fines. But, uh, uh, but beyond that, uh, just a ridicule of a society that calls themselves awakened and, and uh, enlightened and all of our ideas is outdated and old fogey. Yeah. This is a time where the church needs to make up its mind whether we're going to go with the book or we're going to go with the world. We need to make a decision on whether we're going to believe the preachers of the truth or we're going to go with those that, well, uh, compromise that truth. Amen. Uh, I, uh, I, I really believe that, there are, that there, are, there are people even in our world that would rather die with a lie than live with the truth. They hate the truth. The devil opposes the truth. Amen. And so, um, in, in one sense, it's no different today than it was in Jeremiah's day. But we see in Jeremiah direct persecution of the preaching of the truth of God's word. And so because of his preaching, Jeremiah is cast into this deep, dark dungeon. And, uh, and, and what a pitiful condition he finds himself in. This is, uh, this is a, a designed dungeon. It doesn't happen by accident. Somebody has, has, has built this prison, and then in the middle of this prison, there is either an abandoned well that they have turned into a, a pit that, uh, that is reserved for the hardest of criminals, or else they have dug down a pit. It, it, either, either way, it's a deep hole in the ground, and it was designed to isolate and to humiliate the hardest of criminals that were put in that prison. They're not just in a, uh, in a bedchamber with bars. They're in a hole in the ground, and it was designed as a form of torture. And so it was intentionally built. Let me tell you, the devil designs his attacks against us. Yes, Amen. We don't just accidentally fall into a pit. 
I believe that the devil is doing everything he can to try to put us in a pit. And, and whatever it is that, that, that will hinder us in our progress or silence the truth, that's what he wants to use on you and he wants to use on me. This is a design dungeon. It is a deep dungeon. It is so deep that it is inescapable. They lower him down. They lower Jeremiah down into this pit by, by cords, the Bible says. And when he is finally rescued, he has to be rescued the same way. They have to lower ropes down into this pit and pull him up out of this, this deep dungeon. So I imagine it as a... Uh, as a claustrophobic situation, it's a, it's a small hole in the ground, very deep, and, um, and it is a dark dungeon. There are, there are places that we can read in, in other parts of the scripture, for instance, Lamentations chapter 3, where, where uh, later on Jeremiah writes, and he says, listen to this, this is Lamentations now, verse 55, I called upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. Thou hast heard my voice. Hide not thine ear uh, at my breathing, at my cry. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou said, fear not. And, and, and that's important to us because he's, he is testifying later about it being a low dungeon. We take other scriptures and he implies that they had covered it with hewn stone. So, uh, so if that be the case, after they put him down in that pit, they rolled a, uh, a huge millstone over the top of it, which, cr which created a lid, so to speak, which, which, which makes us know that it had to have been very dark in that dungeon. He's in a deep dungeon. He is in a dark dungeon, and he is in a dirty dungeon. Amen. The Bible says here that there wasn't really water in, in that pit, but apparently they had dug down far enough where there was seepage into that pit and, and there was mire or mud. So, uh, so if it was a well, the well has gone dry except for the muddy bottom of it. And, and uh, if it was a dug pit, then they got down to where there was moisture and water and, and there, there was mud. And it wasn't just enough to get on the soles of his feet. He said it, he sank into the mire. Amen. He sank into the mire. I don't know how deep it was, but imagine days and nights. We don't know how long exactly that he was in there, but we get the impression it was, it was for a while anyways. The long days, the long nights that he was in this deep and dark and dirty prison. Amen. Uh, this is a, this is, it's a sad situation to imagine him in. Amen. <clears throat> you all with me tonight? Hey Amen. I want to tell you that, uh, uh, that uh, we all get in similar situations from time to time in our life. We all get in deep, dark dungeons like this. We may not, it may not be literal, uh, obviously, uh, but spiritually speaking, we have all found ourselves in those dark places where we can't see what's ahead or what's behind. Amen. We've all found ourselves in those dark times where we can't figure it out and there seems to be no way out. And, and, and it seems to be inescapable. And we've all found ourselves in those deep holes in the ground where we just don't know how we will ever see the light of day again. Amen. And, and, and those dirty, uh, cumbersome times in our life where it just seems like we're getting deeper and deeper and deeper in the mire of this world. Amen. If you'll bear with me, I'd really like to preach to you about daybreak in the dungeon. But we're not going to appreciate daybreak until we understand the dark. Until we understand the depth. Until we understand the dirt that Jeremiah had found himself in. Amen. I'd like to tell you tonight, the devil would love for, for you, amen, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to find your final chapter in life as a deep, dark dungeon. But let me tell you, that's not not God's plan. That's not God's will. Amen. I believe that God has other plans. He's able to bring us up out of that pit. He's able to bring us out of that darkness. I believe in the delivering power of Almighty God tonight. Amen. Let me tell you. 
I just want to I just want to uh, slow down here a minute m- uh, more to tell you that 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 y- you understand what it means to be in a pit but what you may not know that it is even preachers get in pits from time to time and 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 these uh, these pits are, are are not only pits of persecution which I've already described the enemy directly against us but there are also pits of personal problems as well amen because we are not we are not angels hiding our wings under these uh, suit coats here tonight. Amen. We are men just like you. And we're, we're just as shocked and surprised as you are that the Lord would call us to preach his wonderful word and to proclaim the grace of God. I've already told you where I came from. I was a nothing. I was a nobody when the Lord found me. And to think that he would take a long-haired, hitchhiking hippie and turn him into a holiness preacher is a miracle of God's mercy. I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. Amen. I'm just telling you that, uh, that, that, that we are just men. Uh, we, we, we bleed just like you, you bleed. Amen. We go through the same problems, the same struggles, the same difficulties that you find yourself going through. The only thing is that, that, uh, that, there's, a certain, that there, there's a certain level of expectation concerning preachers. And, and, and I'm not talking here about behavior in the sense of whether it's... Uh, sinful or or uh, or uh, compromising. Uh, I think that the scripture elevates the standard for ministry, and so there's a there's an enormous responsibility to God that comes along with the ministry. Amen. But I'm talking about the expectations of people. Somehow or another, when we go through a bad day, or when he goes through a bad day, uh, we just sort of have to smile our way through it and shake everybody's hand in spite of it. Hello? Hey, man, I'm not talking about being hypocritical here or pretentious, but there's a certain level of expectation. We have to be strong because God's called us to be strong. That's what leaders do. That's the qualifications and the expectations of a leader. And and the reality is that oftentimes people never know, never know the personal inward struggles and battles that preachers go through. Amen. Martin Luther was considered one of the great reformers of our day, of course, um, he led the, the spearhead of the break from the Catholic Church. And uh, you know at least a little bit about the history of Martin Luther. He would go out, he nailed his thesis 93 points uh, uh, against the Catholic Church, nailed it to the, to the, the door of the, uh, of, of the, uh, of the bishop's uh, uh, residence and, 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 and stood you know, alone for a long time. But, but history records to a smaller degree that there were many times that, that Luther would go home and for days he would wallow in his bedroom alone, crying himself to sleep every night, a deep depression that came upon him because he was in the intensity of the battle and nobody ever saw that out in public. He was the great and mighty reformer, the man of God, but he was a man. And I'm going to tell you that men of God, amen, feel many of the same emotions that all men feel. There is frustration at times. There is disappointment at times. Yes, there is even anger at times. We don't always understand everything that's going on, but, uh, but uh, we, uh, we, have to, we have to do what God's called us to do. It's an honor. It's a privilege. I, I told you at the very beginning, you remember, let me rewind. I told you this is not a pity party for preachers tonight. I'm just telling you that even preachers find themselves in pits. So don't let it surprise you if you find yourself in a pit sometime. Whether that's a pit of persecution, people on the job that make fun of you for the way you live, and then uh, people at school that make fun of you for the way that you live, whatever that persecution is or whatever the personal problem is that has got you so low and so discouraged and so down, Amen. It would be like a dungeon to you. Oh, but I want to tell you tonight that daybreak is going to come. Amen. Daybreak is going to come. Amen. And that's the wonderful part of this story concerning Jeremiah. Why don't you lift your hands and praise him tonight? Amen. Let me just say a little bit more about 
about the, the, the mire of this dungeon before we go on. You know, the devil loves dirt. <laughs> He's a dirty devil. He loves dirt. Amen. He's the father of all of those. Amen. The book of James says that, that, that if you backslide, you're like a dog that returns to his vomit and a pig that wallows in the mire. That's what he said. Amen. Uh, the devil is the father of all of them that wallow in the mire. Come on now. Amen. Amen. He loves dirt. I'm going to tell you, he loves, he, loves to, uh, he loves to bring up dirt and he loves to throw dirt. And we're in the midst of a, another political season. Here we are just a week or so away from, or a couple of weeks from election time. And I'm telling you, these dirty campaigns, mud slinging every direction and, you know, bringing one another down. Rather than telling the great promises of what they'll do, they drag everybody else down. I don't like that mud slinging. But let me tell you, uh, I like it less when it's inside the church. Because I know that the devil is the one that loves to sling mud. He's a dirty devil. Amen. But if we're not careful, if we get caught up in that mud slinging, we get caught up in that dirt throwing, uh, we eventually get uh, mired down in it. We get bogged down in it. I don't want to get bogged down in the mire of this dungeon. I want something higher. I want something better. I want something brighter than that. How about you? Amen. Uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, this dirt, uh, this mud, this mire, this is not a place where I want to stay. Amen. Uh, although sometimes I have been the victim of that mud throwing. Hello. Amen. Praise God. Woo, boy. Amen. This gossip and slander and backbiting and all of that that goes on, it's carnal, it's worldly, it's fleshly, and amen, often cr cr crosses the line into sinful, and we know where its origin is. It's part of the enemy's plan to get you bogged down in the mud and the mire of this world. Amen. Uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, there, uh, there are also... There is also uh, muddy messes that we create for ourselves. Amen. How about muddy money messes? Now say that three times fast. Amen. We get in a financial problem. There's nothing that keeps us awake more than wondering how we're going to make ends meet. And, uh, and, and, and pushing the pencil and figuring out how we're going to pay the bills and all of that. Now, uh, I'm not saying in every case, I'm not saying, you know, that there's not exceptions to this rule, but a lot of times we've created our own money messes, uh, and here we are bogged down in this muddy money mess. Uh, financial problems. How about muddy moral messes? Muddy moral messes. Hey, man, let me just throw this out to you. I know, I, I'm telling you, sometimes the pit is persecution, but sometimes the pit is personal problems and personal problems that are caused directly by the devil or personal problems that we've created for ourselves. And some of them are the reality of a of a sinful age that we live in where so much is available, amen, at, 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 a, at the click of a mouse, amen. And if, if we're not careful, we're soon off into websites and territories and reading things and listening to things and watching things, hello, that have created a muddy moral mess for us that we can't seem to get up out of. Amen. I don't want to stay bogged down in the muddy, uh, uh, the muddy uh, floor of this pit. I believe that God has a higher plan than that. Amen. And on and on we could we could uh, spiritualize and 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 try to make some uh, dramatic implications here concerning this pit. But the reality is, Amen, that this preacher was in a pit. He was in a pit. He was down low. Amen. Now, uh, uh, Brother Goldison, would you mind to help me? I've, I've hesitated tonight, been a little uh, unsure whether to put you in this situation or not. But if you don't mind, amen, first of all, to let you know that you appreciate him and you're for him. Give him a hand clap right now, all right? All right. Come here, Brother Jeremiah. Amen. All right. 
All right, Brother Jeremiah, and if you don't mind, just sit there on the end of that, that altar. Give us the impression that you're, you're, you know, you're low, you're down in the pit. Here's Jeremiah. Hey, man, he's down. Boy, are you acting here, brother? Or is it? Okay. All right. Well, you're close to the altar. We'll pray about this, okay? Hey, man, so here's Jeremiah. He's down in, he's down in the pit. He's down low. He's all the things we've already said. Dark, amen, and 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 deep and 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 dirty, and and uh, and and this is a sad sight. Jeremiah was that man of God that we're talking about, uh, amen. To, to think about Jeremiah in this condition breaks my heart. When I read it, it stirs me to think of him down there in that deep dark dungeon, amen, wallowing in the mire. And, uh, and, and that's why I love this man that I can barely say his name except that I practiced it a few times. Um, Ebed Melek, the Ethiopian eunuch. Hey Amen. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to trust myself to say that many times, so I'm just going to call him 3E tonight, okay? E- Ebed Melek, the Ethiopian eunuch. Hey Amen. 3E. Praise God. Now, uh, uh, now Ebed Melech is uh, uh, is a great man. This is the only time in the Bible we read about him. But I love him, and when I get to heaven, I, I hope he's there because I want to meet him. It's these unsung heroes that that that, that, that fascinate me. He, he's not Jeremiah, Amen. He's not the preacher, but he's a preacher helper. He's a preacher backer. Amen. He, in, in this sense, he's going to turn out to be a preacher puller. Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Uh, and I'm going to have the preacher's son, Brother Eric, if you would. Uh, I'm going to change your name to old Triple E here tonight, okay? So, uh, so Ebed Melek, uh, he, hears about, he hears about Jeremiah in the dungeon, and, uh, and, and it breaks his heart, too. And so uh, when he hears about it, he's astonished that, that, that this has happened. How can this happen? But he makes this bold step of going directly to the king and presenting his case to the king who, who uh, uh, actually signed the order for, thi- for this to happen. Now, the king, I'm not sure, uh, reading the facts, how much he knows or, uh, you know, how much uh, direct um, influence he's had on this decision, but he's, he's not totally ignorant of it. He has participated in it. So when Ebed Melek, oh, 3 e amen, when he makes this decision to go to the king, this takes some courage, but he goes to the king, so go up there to one of those thrones up there, brother, and... Uh, and, and he goes to the king, and he pleads with the king. And he says, he says, oh, king, he said, this is, what they have done to this preacher is evil. What they have done to Jeremiah, it's wrong. Amen. And he could have got his head cut off for approaching the king concerning this. He could have suffered a, 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 a like prison sentence for doing this. But he knew in his heart that the way that they were treating the man of God was not right. Amen. Thank God for Triple E tonight. Uh, give, us some, give us some modern three E's. Amen. That understand the power of preaching the truth and understand the anointing of God. This calling of God that's on Jeremiah, it is, first of all, God who appointed him, and it is secondly, God who anointed him. Amen. Don't you ever forget that church. And I, and I say that with all due respect, I'm a stranger among you, except for that one time, two years, two and a half years ago that I was here. Amen. And so I don't know anything. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to throw this out and, 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 and caution you to be careful about how you treat the man of God. Amen. They are God appointed and God anointed. That doesn't mean that you can't have discussions about any, you know, doctrinal issues. And that doesn't mean that a preacher can't be approachable. We're supposed to be approachable. Let's talk about it. Let's reason about it. Even God says, come now. Let's reason together, saith the Lord. Let's talk this over. Amen. Uh, but I, but I want to caution you. You be careful about those criticisms. You be careful about being on the wrong side of this 
issue. Amen. Because what those men did in putting Jeremiah in that pit was evil and it was wrong. I don't know who originally gave the issue. Maybe the king himself. I don't know who signed that order. But what ebed Melech said was, those men have done wicked. They have done evil in how they have treated Jeremiah. Don't be on the wrong side of that issue. Hello? Yeah. Hey, Amen. He, he, I love this man. I, I've never met him, obviously, but I like his character. Hey, Amen. First of all, I like, I like the fact that he has passion. He is passionate about it. There's a fire burning in his soul. He wants to stand for the truth. He wants to come to the rescue of the man of God. He's not going to just sit on a padded pew once a week and go through the motions. He's got a fire burning in his heart. He's got a passion that leads him to go to the king. I'm going to tell you, amen, um, uh, there, 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 there's uh, uh, people uh, sitting in church pews all across the country that get stirred up more about the world series uh, than they do about what's going on in the spiritual realm. What excites you tonight? Amen. What thrills you tonight? If we're giving all of our attention towards the things of this world, we're going to miss it. Amen. We need to get a passion about the things of God. Hey Amen. It's wrong that we can that we can quote the statistics of every ball player on, all, on every team, uh, but uh, hard pressed to quote a scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Right. <laughs> Woo. Hey Amen. It depends on what we're passionate about. Hey Amen. Oh my, I could go down that avenue for a long time, but I'm just telling you, he's got passion. Yeah. Hey Amen. And he's got a purpose. And his purpose is to do everything he can to intervene and intercede on the behalf of his preacher. Amen. Now, I know that the, the man in this story, and I'm not going to attempt to say his name without being up there where I can read it, but the king in this story, he's a, he's a, he's a carnal king. But, but can I just twist that just for a moment and, and speak of ebed Melech going to the king and, and, and talk about prayer for a minute as a purpose of intervening with the king on behalf of our preacher, on behalf of our pastor, intervening, interceding, amen, not just for the preacher, but on behalf of one another. Listen, you've got friends maybe sitting here in this church tonight, maybe within an arm's reach of you right now. You know they're low. You know they're in a dark time. You know they're going uh, through a, a, a bad time. This is not the time to throw dirt in their eyes or kick them in the side. It's time to go to the king. It's time to have a purpose uh, to try to find a way to get them out of that, uh, uh, of that low place. Right. Amen. Praise God. But then I like this. When the king says, uh, all right, all right, Ebed Melech, you've made your case. Uh, I, I understand. I'm going to grant you permission to go and, uh, and, and get him out. And I grant you permission to take as many as 30 men with you if you, if you need. And, uh, and so uh, he says, go, uh, and gives him, uh, gives him leave to rescue Jeremiah out of that pit. So he's not only a man of passion now, and he's not only a man of purpose, but he's a man with a plan. Praise God. Woo, hallelujah. I'm going to do something to help my preacher. I'm going to do something to help my pastor. And so he goes and, and, uh, and, and, and he goes under the treasury of the king's palace, and he's looking for stuff that he can use, and he scrounges around, and he looks down in there, and he says, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe I can use that. And, uh, oh, yeah, maybe I can use that. And uh, uh, definitely need those ropes. And so he scrounges around in there under the, under the stairway of the, of the treasury of the king's house. Um, and, uh, and he gets some stuff together. And, and if I was nearby, I'd say, uh, Tripoli. Hey, if I was there, I'd say the other name. But right now I'm saying, hey, three, what are you doing there? Uh, I don't know what I don't know what you're doing with those old rags, those old cast clouts, uh, but and I don't know what you're doing with those ropes, uh, 
but he knew what he was doing. He had it in his mind. He's got a plan. He's thinking it through. And then he starts hollering for help. He gathers together uh, some men. Uh, can I help you in some way? Yes, sir. Uh, all right. Uh, I want you to call for Brother Guy. Brother Guy, need your help. Come on, hurry. We need help. Um, how about two more? Brother Kevin, we need help. Come on, we need help. How about one more? How about my son-in-law there? Yeah, Brother Tim, come help us. He was smiling before uh, he even called his name. He kind of knew he wasn't going to get out of this. All right. No, 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 don't tie those together. Untie the ropes, and I'm, I'll show you here what's going to happen, okay? And then I want, uh, Brother Guy, you stand on that side of the pulpit, about in front of that monitor, and uh, Brother 3E, stand right here, okay? Now, this is, this is important, all right? Because he had a plan. He knew in his mind exactly what he was doing. And concerning those, those cast clouts and those rags, the scripture tells us exactly what he did with them. But here, before we get to that, let me tell you, hey man, when, he, when those men get there to that place inside the prison courtyard where there's this deep, dark hole in the ground, they find that there's a huge stone barrier, a lid that's over that pit. Amen. And they're going to have to move that stone. Woo, doesn't this sound familiar? Wow. Praise God. Right. Amen. Who is going to roll away the stone? Yeah. You remember that? Amen. Praise God. And in this case, it's not angelic intervention, but old 3E and his men, they come. Now listen, I read to you from Lamentations where Jeremiah prayed his prayer. Y'all are thinking I'm preaching into overtime here. Bear with me. I'm, 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 not much, uh, uh, I'm not much longer. But here it is. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 55. I called upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. Thou hast heard my voice. Hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. You hear the desperateness in that prayer? Amen. Uh, uh, what we don't know, uh, the lid that's over that pit may drown out the sounds to others. But down there in that low and lonely place, um, there's a man of God who's crying out, amen, to the God who has saved him and the God who has called him and the God who has anointed him, amen. And he's crying out, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, deliver me. Get me out of here. Oh, Lord, help me. Can I encourage you tonight? Don't quit praying. Don't stop calling on God. I don't know how many days and how many nights he was in this condition and the devil whispering in his ear, see, God doesn't hear. See, God doesn't care. God's going to let you rot away and die in this hole in the ground. But he kept on a crying to the Lord. Let me tell you, don't you believe that? devil that's lying to you tonight and telling you that you're never going to get out of this. You're never going to get back on your feet. That you're all this is where it ends. This is not where your story ends unless you quit calling on the Lord. But if you call upon him, it may be that even right now he's got a rescue mission being planned for you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Who knows but what tonight he's got a rescue mission mission being dispatched for you hallelujah, hallelujah. oh praise god amen and, and you remember uh, reading a few years ago i think 2010 down in the nation of chile those those miners got trapped down in there they were over 2,000 feet below ground level trapped in a hole for, amen, for 63 or 64 days. They were down there. That's over two months. They were down there in the darkness. Amen. Wondered if they would ever get out. And But all the time up above, there were people from all over the world, experts and engineers that were planning. They were plotting. Amen. They had, a, uh, they had to design it. Eventually, they drilled a hole through that rock and debris, uh, just enough to get a, a microphone down through there with a little speaker on it. They fed it 
all the way down there and in the darkness. And those men heard a little voice coming out of their out of that uh, little speaker. Is anybody there? Is anybody still alive? Amen. Is anybody still alive? They jumped to their feet and started hollering, Yes, yes, we're still alive. Help us, help us. Amen. The voice from up above said, Amen. Hold on. Help is on the way. Praise God. <laughs> Woo! Praise Brother Guy. Help is on the way. Amen. There they were down in that pit. They had to drill a hole a little bit larger to, to get food and water down to them. And eventually they drilled a hole wide enough that they could let a man-sized capsule down in there. And, and when I saw the picture of it, it kind of looked like one of those, uh, one of those little uh, capsules you see at the bank when you go through the drive-thru. You know, the little lid opens. You put your money into it, close it, and then it goes, whoosh, there it goes. Hey, man, that's what my money does every day. Whoosh, man, there it goes. Hey, man, that looked like that little capsule. And, and, and one at a time, they could get into it, close that door, and stand there, and they would be hoisted out, uh, uh, up out of that hole. Woo! <laughs> my, my, my. Hold on! Help is on the way! Yes. Hey, man. Uh, Jeremiah down there pleading and praying and crying out to God. Uh, I wonder, uh, amen, at what point he got the realization of it. Uh, but I think that at some point he heard a still small voice down in his heart that reassured him, the Lord hasn't forgotten you, brother. The Lord knows exactly where you're at. He knows what you're going through. If you just hold on, help is on the way. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me just throw this in here. I'm getting way out of line here. I, I hope that I'm not overstaying my welcome. But, but you know what? God could have sent an angel and done the same thing. And we see angels at work all through the scripture, right? Amen. But we also see men at work through the scriptures. And God sometimes prefers to use men. And you know what, brother and sister? That's an honor that God would choose to use you instead of an angel. Amen. Praise God. Oh, three. Amen. He had a plan. Well, first they had to roll the stone away. I don't know how many days. I don't know how many nights. But can you imagine with me that moment? when he could hear the sound of that rock scraping against rock. Amen. As that stone started being moved away. Brothers, come on, uh, come on, move that stone away. Uh, you're up there. He's down here, okay? You all stay up there. Move that stone. Uh, if you Use your imagination. You hear the sound of that rock being rolled out of the way. Amen. And then suddenly, the golden lights of the sun rays shine down into the darkness. It's daybreak in the dungeon. Amen. Something is happening today that hasn't happened in a long time. A ray of hope just shone through. Somehow or another, I believe again that God has heard my prayer. It's daybreak. Daybreak in the dungeon. Why don't you lift your hands and give the Lord the praise tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. Woo, glory. On this Sunday night, I, I'm not sure at what stage of this story you're at. Some of you might have just got into your pit and you don't know how long you're going to be there. But some of you have been in it for a while. And I just want to tell you tonight, praise God that I think I hear the sound of the stone scraping. And I think if you look real close, you might just see and sense a ray of hope coming into your dark world that God has heard your prayers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then the voice of three hollers the name Jeremiah. Here's the plan. Three, he says, I'm going to throw these rags down to you. Now catch them. 
All right, and so he takes these old cast clouts, thrown away clothes, whatever they were, and rotten rags, it was all he could find. Uh, maybe the preacher deserves better than this, but, you know, it's an emergency. So he throws the cloths down there. And then he says, now, now, now let me show you how, how I want to do this. Uh, two of your men, on the, one of you get over there with Brother Guy. One of you, Brother Tim, get over here with, with Brother Eric. And, uh, and each of you hold an end of that rope. Now, you would, you would actually let this down like this. One of you each holding an end of the rope. And I'll show you why, okay? All right? Each of you hold the end of the rope and then let the, the sagging end down into it. There you go. Back up there on the, on the uh, lid. I don't want, brother, I've got one man in the pit here already. I don't want it to be... I don't want it to be said, Brother Blue came and got us all down in the pits. We need more ropes. Hey, man, they'll already be saying, boy, that preacher was for the pits. <laughs> all right. So he hollers the name Jeremiah again. Jeremiah! Going to throw you some ropes. Going to throw you some ropes. Yeah. Now here's what... Now, here's what Jeremiah needs to do. ebed Melech tells him, take those old rags, those old cast clouts, and put them under your armholes and your armpits, okay? So, really, you're going to kind of, you're going to wad them up like this. Here's the reason why. Because these ropes are going to go under the arm. Right. All right? Okay? That's why I say ebed Melech is thinking this through. He's got a plan. Now, this right here, my friends, is important. Now, stand up, Pastor, if you don't mind. And, and uh, oh, yeah, that's good. Well, actually, we're backwards, but let's, tra let's trade arms, okay? Yeah, turn you around. Yeah, turn around. There you go. And now let's do the same thing. Y'all might want to help him so I can preach on here for a minute. I just want to tell you that this is an important little detail. They're going to have to pull Jeremiah up. And without some padding there, those ropes are going to burn his arms. Okay? And he knows in advance that that's what's going to happen. So he, he prepares for that. Now, I believe that symbolically, <laughs> I love this. Symbolically, what he is saying is, hey, man, brother, we're not here to hurt you. We're here to help you. We're not here to hurt you. We got to get you out of this pit. And we want to make this as easy on you as we possibly can. This is an act of love. Amen. This little simple deed is a display of love. It's a tender act, this man, Triple E, he thinks of. We don't want to hurt this man. He's been hurt enough. Amen. We want to help him, and we want to do this as painless as possible. Woo, glory. Let me tell you tonight, praise God, sometimes an old rough preacher comes in in his rough way, is trying to throw you a lifeline, and you might think, hey, amen, this is painful. I can't handle it. Hey, amen. But can I? I just tell you tonight, I'm not here to hurt anybody. I'm not here to hurt anybody. I didn't come to hurt anybody. Amen. This pastor gets up, what, two or three times a week to preach the word of God. He's not here to hurt you. Amen. He's here to help you. He's going to pat it all he can to try to, amen, to help you. But it's still going to require some pulling. And you're, hey, come on now. Amen. We don't want it to be painful, but, uh, but you got to understand this. There's a lot of people that walk out of churches, amen, because they think that the preacher's too rough or somebody gave them some advice that they didn't like. And the reality is we're, we're trying to help. We're not trying to hurt. Amen. Now, we can't literally do this. But if you all would reach up as high as you can and just put a little tightness on that rope. And with 30 or so men behind them and the strength of all of those men on those long ropes, they pulled Jeremiah up out of that pit. 
Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jeremiah didn't stay in the pit. Amen. There were some long, lonely, low days, but he didn't stay in the pit. He went on to preach, amen, many more messages. He preached many more years. And the reality is, while he was in that pit for a season, he didn't stay in the pit. And I believe tonight that it's important for you to understand that too. Amen. This is just a season. This is just a brief time in your life compared to the big plan and scope. You're going to come out of this pit and, amen, the sun's going to shine again and, oh, glory to God, amen, you're not going to stay in this low, dark, dirty dungeon. Praise the Lord. Oh, glory to God. Amen. Welcome home, Jeremiah. Welcome home, Jeremiah. Rejoice with your friends. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Can I tell you tonight, we need some preacher pullers. We need some preacher pullers. Where's that rope, Brother Erica? Let me tell you something. Quit throwing rocks and start throwing ropes. I, I say it again. Stop throwing rocks and start throwing ropes. Praise God. And... Amen. Pastor, come and help me here. Now, let's you and I get on the other side of these, these ropes. You get that one, all right? You get that one. Amen. Praise God. We've been, we've been the recipient of grace and mercy. We've been helped. We've been encouraged. Amen. You know that about me, and I know that about you. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's why we want to do everything we can to throw a rope to somebody else. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, brother. Let us, let us help you tonight. Let God help you. Amen. You might have preferred that an angel would come down and roll the stone away for you. But, amen, this is what you got. But we would like to see you come up out of that pit. We really would. Sister Goldeisen, would you want to get a song for us? And, amen. Let's all stand together right now. Now stay right there if you will. Because I'd, like I'd like to encourage somebody, amen, to get a hold of the rope tonight. Who is it? What is it that you need? Amen. You feel like the Lord's trying to reach you this evening? Come on, sister.